Thank you. Thank you. Please take your seats, relax. Thank you. Hey, if you wouldn't mind, though, if you are uh, serving in law enforcement, former law enforcement, first responder, you know, fire, uh, would you please stand up? I'd like to acknowledge you guys in the room. So if you've served in that capacity, thank you guys for your service. Love you guys so much. Thank you. So good to be here with you all uh, this morning. If you guys have your Bibles, wouldn't mind turning to 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, that's the text I'll be reading from in just a little bit here. Uh, you know, as you guys saw and, and heard, uh, former U.S. Navy SEAL, and I imagine most of you in the room probably know what a Navy SEAL is, but there was a time back in Huntington Beach, my hometown, where a, a girl asked me if that meant that I worked at SeaWorld or something. And so, <laughs> just to clarify, here's a little bit you might not know, is that SEAL is actually an acronym, and it stands for our areas of operation, sea, air, and land kind of give you a feel of what my team was doing on land on the last deployment I was involved in. We were out in Iraq, and we were given the task of hunting down men that make suicide vests and roadside bombs like IEDs. And while we're out there, we're working with a group that's called the ISOF. It's the Iraqi Special Operations Forces. And one of our goals with these guys is to simply teach them how to fight their own fights. And so the best way to do that is to not only train them on base, but actually go outside that wire and fight side by side with them. Uh, well, if you can imagine a whole deployment going by, I'd say pretty good, because uh, we've gotten some of these bad dudes off the street, we're making the world a better place, and we were coming up on what looked like just enough time on the calendar to do maybe one more operation before we go home. So we decided for this final operation, why don't we try and make it a graduation operation? We're going to let the ice off, take the lead, plan the whole thing from the ground up, and we'll be there with them just in case things go bad. So they start from scratch. What's the first thing they need? They need some intel to operate on. So they're hitting the streets, and they find this source that tells them about a man that's an Iraqi policeman. So looking at this guy, it's a policeman by day, but at night, back home, as it turns out, he's one of these bomb makers that we're looking for. And to kind of give you an idea of the type of character that makes a suicide vest, you know, oftentimes the guys that fashion these things are not the ones that want to actually put it on. In fact, they have such a difficult time finding somebody to volunteer uh, that in one instance over there, uh, what they did is they took two mentally handicapped women and strapped these vests onto them, shoving them off into a crowded marketplace as they watched from a distance and setting it off like cowards with a remote, killing these women and obviously so many more. Just kind of gives you an idea of some of the characters that we're up against. But the ice off, they've got this guy's number. They figured out where he lives. They've got the whole plan, how they want to approach the house, get in, grab this guy, and extract. It all looks pretty good. But they mentioned one other thing to us. They say, hey, look, we realize, the ISOF, that we get shot at more than you SEALs do, and we think we figured out why. And so we're kind of curious, like, okay, what do you think it is? And they say, it's the color of your uniforms. We're like, really? The color of our uniforms? And they're convinced of it. They're saying, yes. So we're wondering, if, would you be willing to maybe take off your American color uniforms? We got a pile of ISOF uniforms you guys could put on. So like, all right, you want us to put those uniforms on to get shot at more with you. And they're like, yeah, it's like, fine, final operation, it's not about the uniform, let's get them on. Well, the funny thing is, is that my dark complexion, start growing out a little facial hair, then get on one of these Iraqi uniforms, I've got that thing on looking around, and the guys on my team are like, hey, Williams, you really blend in with those guys now, don't you? I'm like, I guess I do. On this final op, I'm standing up in the Humvee in the turret behind the 50 caliber machine gun. And for those of you that don't know, let's just say that's a weapon that could really reach out and touch somebody. I've got my night vision goggles on. I'm looking through my green little world and kind of going over this mental inventory. I'm thinking about all the things that I know firing off in my mind about this night. I know that my, my weapon is headspace in time. That means it's ready to go. I know where this guy lives, how we're gonna get in, grab him, extract. But one unique thing I know about this operation that makes it different than every other operation we've been on, I know this is it. This is the final operation, which also means I know just a matter of days from now, I'm gonna be back Huntington Beach, California, surfing in the ocean. But here's what none of us really knew about that night, was that we were actually being set up the entire time to get thrown into the absolute worst circumstances we'd been in on this entire deployment as we're being set up on an ambush. And now we find ourselves engaging in this gun battle for our lives. And it was the team's ability to shoot, move, communicate, do what we do best as Navy SEALs that ultimately led to the obvious 
possibility of me standing before you here this morning. Now, before I get into the details of of how that all played out towards the end here, I do want to get into God's word and read about another soldier uh, by the name of Naaman. So, 2 Kings chapter 5, if you have it, I'm reading from the New King James Version. I'll go ahead and begin in verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, commander of the army, the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but... A leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids, and they brought back captive a young girl to the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus says the girl who is from the land of Israel. So the king says, Go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed. And he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. All you need to know there is that is the equivalent of millions upon millions of dollars in gold, silver, and apparel. Fast forward to verse 9. We're going to find Naaman on his way with his horses and chariots. And he is headed to enemy-occupied territory, 150 miles. He's going. Verse 9 says, Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and he went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Aban of the far part, the rivers of Damascus, far better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? So how much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down. And dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you right now as we open up your word. And we know this word is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Your words are alive. This is not just ink on paper. And you are intimately aware of the circumstances of every individual here. I'm convinced that nobody is here by mistake. As your scriptures say that you have appointed our times and our boundaries so that we would perhaps seek you and reach for you, though you're not far from any one of us. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit uh, would be here, be active, and move on our hearts and on our minds. I pray that your spirit would do what Jesus says it would come to do, to convict of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Lord, we just pray that this time would be a, a divine time, a divine appointment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If I could just share with you guys a little bit of my my road to becoming a SEAL. Uh, Fresh out of high school, attending a local community college. I didn't have any real big plans. I wasn't passing any of my classes. You know that saying, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it. Unfortunately, that was my aim during that time. Uh, I was just ditching, hanging out with friends, going surfing. But now the end of the year is coming up. It's time to take finals. And I didn't study for these tests. And as I'm pulling into the school parking lot, I think that's where I was really confronted with it. Like it hit me. Like, hey, I'm turning out to be a loser. I mean, the kind of guy that no young person wants to be. I'm not even the average Joe. Like all my peers are passing me by. I can't even make it at a local community college. So I'm thinking, how do I turn this around? Because I do not want to live a wasted life. Nobody wants that life. So I'm brainstorming, I'm thinking, what could I do with my life to turn this around? I'm not making it at school, I'm sitting there in my truck, I'm not gonna pass these classes, and I think I come up with the perfect plan. I know I'm gonna do to turn this all around. I'm gonna go become an Alaskan crab fisherman. I'm thinking, (laughs) deadliest catch, I'm watching it on Discovery Channel, like that's by far one of the most dangerous jobs. There's some honor in that. And I almost settled on that. When the other idea popped into my brain, like, wait, no, why can't I go join the military? And not just that, I want to be a part of the most elite. I want to go through that most difficult, grueling military training. I know what I want to be. I want to be a U.S. Navy SEAL. And so right there, 
school parking lot, Golden West Community College. I just make up my mind. That's what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And so my first order of business is this. If I'm going to be a frog man, I don't need to go to school anymore. Started my truck up and took off out of that school parking lot. <laughs> Never took those tests. And of course, I got to let my dad know some bad news and good news as I phrased it. So I kind of let him know what's going on at school, not really passing any of the classes. And of course, he's kind of face palming like, oh, the good news? Hey, it's all right, dad. I got a plan. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And so kind of put yourself in his shoes for a moment there. Like any good father, he's just trying to be the voice of reason. Like, hey, son, uh, just so you know, joining the military... It's not like anything you've ever done in the past. It's not like playing ball or skateboarding or going to a local community college that when you decide you're over it, you could just stop. He says, if you join the military, maybe then you find out this isn't for you. Or suppose you quit and don't make it through SEAL training. Just to be clear, you will still be in the military. And you're probably going to get a job like chipping paint off some boat in Japan. <laughs> well... My dad knows me best, and he knows those are the motivational words for me right there. I am determined I will not be that person. I'll die before I quit. So I know actions speak louder than words, and so I'm just doing the preparation, all the running and swimming. And as days go by, he invites me inside one day up into his room. He says, okay, so you really want to do this, huh? You want to be a SEAL? I'm like, yeah, dad, I want to be a SEAL. He goes, great. I set up a workout for you with the Navy SEAL. Check out my computer screen. And I'll never forget, as I'm looking over the computer, my thought is, my dad doesn't have any Navy SEAL friends. Like, who is this? And I see in this email, it just says, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? I'm like, play? Like, dad, let me get this straight. You, you met some guy off the internet, says he wants to play with me, and you're arranging all this right now. <laughs> He's a SEAL, son. I'm like, you can't trust everything someone tells you on the way. How do you know this guy's a SEAL? He's a SEAL. I was like, all right, I guess, you know, I'm going to go meet up with the guy. And so as it turns out, there's more of a conversation he had with this man on the phone that I had no, like I had no knowledge of prior to that email. But I'll give you guys the upfront story because it's better that way. So as it turns out, on the phone, he gets on the phone with this guy. He says, hey, look, my son wants to be a Navy SEAL, but here's the deal. He has no idea what he's getting involved in. He doesn't know what he's signing up for. So I'm just asking, could you do me a really big favor? I, I need you to meet up with my son. And what I'm asking you to do, I need you to crush him. Give him a wake-up call. Just bury him. Beat this desire of becoming a seal out of him. So the guy thought about it for a while, and he decides to reply back in the email, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? <laughs> so I don't know what that is all about, but I'm about to go find out. As I meet up with this Navy SEAL in a beach parking lot, he spots me right away. You, Chad? Yes, sir. All right, Bubba. I was Bubba from that point forward. <laughs> Get on over here. He's got me drop down, doing push-ups and sit-ups. He brings a portable pull-up bar you can hang from anywhere. So I'm doing pull-ups outside the bathroom, like at the beach in front of people. There was a guy that was enlisted as a, a Marine, but he'd just gotten out, and he's re-enlisting to be a Navy SEAL. So this is like my, my first exposure to being around any military. I've got a, a SEAL and a Marine, and I'm kind of hanging in there. I'm doing the things that he wants me to do. Sends us both off on a run. This guy, Seth, he was the Marine. He says, all right, Bubba, why don't you and Seth go for this run, you know, 15 minutes down the trail, out into the wetlands and uh, away from the ocean. And 15 minutes into it, you take over. You go as fast as you want to go. Seth's going to lead the way first. And then I'll be there with you 15 minutes into the run. And so we take off. Well, Seth is this real big, brute force, muscular kind of guy, which is great for just plowing a door over, right? Taking control of somebody. But when it comes to running at a fast pace, like I had the edge. At the time, I'm like this little wiry guy. I'm like a gazelle. 15 minutes into the run, I'm taking off on this guy. And so I'm leaving him in the dust. He's gone. I don't see him. And I'm looking over my shoulder thinking, ah, this is just me at the time. I was an arrogant kid. Ah, where's that Marine? I keep running. I'm looking back. I'm not seeing the SEAL. And I start thinking like, hey, maybe I'm too fast for this Navy SEAL. He can't catch up on the run. And I'm thinking of the names of my friends. I was going to be bragging to how the Marine and the SEAL couldn't catch me on the run as I'm looking over my shoulder again. And it's like a scene cut right out of Terminator 2. You remember the bad guy that can like morph into knife hands and chase down a moving vehicle? That's the SEAL coming at me with knife hands like a T-1000, right? There's nothing I could do. He closes that gap. I'm thinking we're just in a foot race, right? He passes me by, and I never saw what was coming next as he just plants down, pivots, turns, and I'm greeted by his fist, just impaling my stomach as I'm going for the ride, just clothesline 
Wind knocked out of me before my back even hit the ground. I just see sky poofing dirt up all around me. And you got to put yourself in my shoes for a moment here. Because remember, the only intel at the time I had was this. Some guy, my dad met off the internet. He's got me on the ground in the wetlands. Like, I'm thinking child predator. This is happening. He is jumping on top of me and just ragdolling me. I still remember that sound of the threads of my shirt just going, ripping, spit flying out of his mouth. He's screaming in my face, going ballistic. I feel like, yeah, the cheek, the forehead. And <laughs> then these words come through. You want to be a Navy SEAL? You better stay three paces behind me. There is something about that moment right there. The pain for a moment went away. Time froze. I knew if I quit right now, I'll forever be a quitter. Like, this is the moment, Chad. If you quit right now, you will forever be a quitter. The way you respond here is going to affect the trajectory of the rest of your life. And then, I mean, the awful feelings come right back. I had the wind knocked out of me after running as fast as I can. It's an awful feeling. I can't even describe it with words. It's just weird noises that you make, right? And he gets up and says it again three paces, and he turns, and he's not letting up. He's showing no mercy. He just takes off. And I know if I quit right now, it's it. And so I'm going after this guy. I'm staying on his heels. And this went on for a handful of miles down this trail. He's trying to rid himself of me, but I'm staying on his heels. And looking back in hindsight, after having gone through SEAL training, which is arguably by far the most difficult military training, I look back and say that was by far the most difficult singular workout. I should call it a beatdown session, this encounter with this Navy SEAL, Scott Helvinston. But we finally get to a point where he, he stops, he ends it. And he circles up and he's pacing back and forth. And I mean, he looks at me like he's a cage fighter, just waiting for the referee to say the words, let's get it on. And at the time, I'm like this teenage skater punk kid. Like, I don't want to project to the Navy SEAL that I'm willing or wanting to fight him at all. So I'm kind of having the self dialogue. I'm like, okay, Chad, don't set this guy off. No direct eye contact, just use your peripherals, right? Don't look him in the eyes. And he breaks this really awkward tension. He just goes, Hey, if we would have gone another mile or two, would you have stayed with me? And I just told him, it's like, Scott, I'll die before I quit. Well, he just gets this big smile on his face, completely changes his demeanor. This is it. He goes, great. Hey, you want to meet up again for the workout tomorrow? <laughs> I'm honestly thinking, like, are we going to address the flashback this guy just had on the trail? <laughs> what was that all about? And of course, he wasn't going to let me know. I didn't find out until months later that he was getting on the phone with my dad after that. And basically tells him, I know what you want me to do, and I gave it a go, but I think your son might have what it takes to make it. I'd like to start meeting up with them. So from that day forward, I began to meet up with this Navy SEAL, and thankfully it was no longer these beat-down sessions. It became more of a, a building up. In fact, I moved on in life from just being Bubba to eventually I became Junior. He really took me under his wing <laughs> as he's looking out after me. And Scott's this extraordinary Navy SEAL. I'll just kind of rattle off some of the records that he holds. He is the youngest man to ever make it through SEAL training. He finished it by the time he was 17 years old. Yes, he's a world champion pin athlete. He's the fastest Navy SEAL on the SEAL training obstacle course. And he was the only man to beat the beast on a TV program at the time called Man vs. Beast, where they take wild animals and put them up against athletes in a competition of strength or speed. Well, he gets on the program with a chimpanzee they train to run through an obstacle course at superhuman speed. Well, on national television, Scott pulls ahead of the monkey on the monkey bars, all right? <laughs> and you can YouTube that one sometime. Navy SEAL versus chimpanzee. And so you can imagine what it's like to be me, you know, to get trained up by this guy. And as time went on, he got me ready. So I sign up. I got a date. It's set. I'm going off now to boot camp. Scott takes an opportunity, as he put it, to go overseas again. It's going to be a very quick turnaround. He's actually leaving before I leave off to boot camp. So he's getting on the phone with me for one last phone call before he goes. He says, all right, Junior, about to go do this thing. He's referring to going to Iraq. And he says, I just want you to know something, though, that I've never told anybody that I've ever trained before. And so that right there really cued me in, like important words coming next. And he says, I know you're going to make it through SEAL training. And to hear, like, that type of vote of confidence from him, it, it, I, I'll never have the words to, like, really put it into words, right? Like, that just meant the world to me. I couldn't wait for my opportunity to, like, to prove him right, to make him proud, and just to do this thing that I've wanted to do from the very beginning now. So he's just reminding me of the timeline. He's only going to be gone a couple months long. It's about the same amount of time. I'll be at Navy boot camp. So when I actually start SEAL training in Coronado, San Diego, he says, I'll be back. I'm going to be there by your side. We're going to see you make it through 
So we say our goodbyes. Can't wait to see you get back, Scott. So he's gone. I'm excited about to get this thing going. I figure for this last handful of days, it's just a handful of days before I go to boot camp. If I can't work out with my mentor in person, the next best thing, I remember the programs. I'll just do those on my own. So I'm up one day, television on in the background, and I remember looking over the screen like I can't believe what I just, I'm seeing on the screen because I'm looking at a picture of Scott smiling. And my first thought's like, what's Scott doing on TV? I didn't know he's going to be on TV again. He's on TV all the time. Phenomenal athlete. And so I'm just trying to figure this out. Smiling image, typical shot they use before they introduce somebody onto a program. I'm just looking at the profile shot. And that's when I see in the lower third of the screen, Scott's birth date, followed by a dash, and it says March 31st, 2004. And before I could process in my mind, like, what that means, I didn't even have an opportunity. Because then it switches from the smiling image of him to graphic video footage of a vehicle burning in the background, which was the vehicle that he was in, along with three other Americans, as their vehicle was ambushed by a group of insurgents that videotaped everything that they were doing now to their lifeless bodies as they ripped them out of the vehicles. And they find sticks and rods, and this angry Iraqi mob begins to beat and wail away, just doing everything they can to try and mutilate their bodies. And it's just cutting to these different scenes now as this footage is being spread around. Very similar to what groups like ISIS do today. It's never enough to behead a bunch of Christians or to set a Jordanian pilot on fire. They want to videotape it and spread it all around. And so now I'm watching this footage as these guys find rope and wrap it around their legs and hook them up to vehicles because they were too weak to drag them themselves for very long. So they hook them to vehicles and drag them through the streets of Fallujah like it's a celebration. They get to the Euphrates River Bridge and string them upside down set their bodies on fire, and then chant over and over into the camera, Fallujah's the graveyard of Americans. Fallujah's the graveyard of Americans. Needless to say, I'll never have the words to describe what just all those surrounding events and moments were like. I heard the Fallujah's the graveyard of Americans loud and clear. I'm not going to lie, a big part of me wanted revenge. I went through all the different emotions. And revenge is a fuel. It's not a good fuel to live off of, but it is a fuel. So it's just one of those things, you just don't go forward the same person from there. Uh, but I do think that there is a takeaway for all of us, and it has to do with dealing with adversity. See, a lot of times the adversity that we face has to do with outside circumstances that we literally have no control over. You have no control over it. Everyone here has faced adversity, at least to some degree. And here's the thing, is it's not a singular event, is it? It's imminent that there will be more. Nobody's immune to that. And so you have to kind of prepare yourself in a way ahead of time. Like realize that you are going to face more adversity. It's not an if, it's a when. So if you have no control over that, what's the one thing you do have control over? You control the way that you respond. You are the determiner of if that adversity is going to be what we can ultimately call a wing or a weight. Will you allow it to be a weight that just sinks you, leaves you knocked down, never to get back up again? People just say, that's it. They're out for the count. They're never coming back from that one. Or do you find a wing in there somehow? It's just a way to rise to the occasion. So our seal creed, it says forged by adversity. You will either fail because of adversity or you will be forged by adversity. And so there's a lot of ways that you find that wing based off of the circumstances that you're in. That wing is just that that way to rise to the occasion, right? And so I'll just share in that instance for me, where I found it was, you know, when we lose somebody, we always go back to the last conversation we had with them because it just becomes that much more important, doesn't it? I mean, that was it. So what what did we say? I was like trying to reflect on that. And that's when I remember Scott's words when he said to me, Junior, I know you're gonna make it through SEAL training. I guess you could say that that was the beginning right there of, of a wing, what got me off my my butt back on my feet. You know, for a moment there, I was a little beat down, like, should I even go forward with this anymore? But then I was determined, I'm going to do this, but I want to do it for so much more on the line now. I want to do this in honor and memory of my mentor. And like I said, part of me wanted some revenge. And so I enter into SEAL training. I've got his name written on the inside of my head as a constant reminder, this motivation to make it through. And SEAL training is by far the most difficult military training, like I alluded to. Uh, Something I I think I could share with you all that I didn't share with first service. In fact, this is not shared. I'll share with you the most difficult part of SEAL training. It's the day before you graduate. And I want you to know that this is not recorded in any SEAL book or any SEAL movie. 
But a group like this, I want to share something a little exclusive with you all. The most difficult day of training, the day before you graduate. To set it up, the first day of training amongst all the tortures these instructors put you through, right? You ultimately run hundreds of miles throughout training, thousands of push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups. Uh, something that most people are aware of now, especially with the explosion of social media. Obviously, we have dogs in our platoons, right? These attack and bomb dogs. But what you might not know is that you get a dog in the beginning of training as a puppy. And you might think that sounds pretty cool because it does sound kind of cool. But here's the truth. The deal is <laughs> the last thing you want to deal with at the end of a very long day of training some whiny, poopy, peeing dog keeping you up all night. This animal's like a little torture device. And the instructors know the sleep deprivation this animal will put you through. But you know that same man's best friend. It's true. Whether you like it or not, this dog does kind of begin to grow on you. As you're looking out for him, he's your little ally, your little buddy. I named my dog Nacho, all right? Nacho! <laughs> but like I said, getting around to this most difficult day of training the day before you graduate, see... In order to demonstrate that as a Navy SEAL, you are prepared, if this is what's required of you, to take life. You have to take this dog that you've loved and looked out for, and it's with your own bare hands. You have to turn and break its neck. I'm just playing with you guys. You don't do that to a dog in SEAL training. No. Come on. You do it to a cat. So... <laughs> All right, just to be clear, first service didn't get that joke. I didn't share that. And uh, there's no animals harmed in SEAL training. They don't give you a dog in the beginning of training. Like, there's none of that, all right? Man, you guys took that one, though, hook, line, and sinker. I, 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 just for the time's sake, I guess the numbers do speak for themselves. SEAL training, I started the class of 173 guys. By graduation day, only 13 of that original class number still standing there. And uh, look back to that day in the parking lot. Man, if I could just become a SEAL, I thought, oh, you know, that would be a fuel I could live off of and burn on for the rest of my life. And then on top of all that, doing it in honor and memory of my mentor, who was really, his, his name on the inside of my hat, my family, my friends there. So I'm getting the trident and the insignia. He says, you've done it, pinned it in my chest. Not only was this one of the happiest, most fulfilling moments of my life, but strangely, I couldn't make sense of it. Later on, within 24 hours, I felt like I started going through some of the lowest times and life just seemed to circle a drain from that point forward and I couldn't wrap my mind around why. At the time, I just achieved. And it was years later I heard these words spoken by a Christian philosopher, Ravi Zacharias, and I thought, man, those words hits the nail on the head. And this is what he said. He says, one of the loneliest moments a man will ever experience is when he's achieved that which he thought would deliver the ultimate and the end, it lets him down. What he's referring to right there is something I believe everyone in this room, man and woman, is familiar with at least to some degree. It's the human condition. It's the whole idea that grass is always greener on the other side. Never quite satisfied where we're at. Well, what do you want? I just want a little bit more. And so we buy into the belief that if I could just get to this achievement, this goal over here, then I will be satisfied. So what happens is, is we get a goal or an achievement in our crosshairs. We've got the target. There it is. And we have the hunger for it. And that hunger leads to some good stuff, the drive, the hard work, the discipline. And have you ever gotten there? Have you ever achieved? You eat that moment up and you are satisfied just like you thought you would be. But what happens? Strangely, the satisfaction doesn't last quite like you expected it to. And so what do you do? Well, you don't panic here. You just kind of step back for a moment. You do a little thinking and the light goes off. Ah, I know what it is. The reason this didn't give me lasting fulfillment, it's simple. I didn't go for something big enough. If I really want it to last, I need to raise the bar. I need to make my way up this totem pole. I need to trek up the mountain a little bit higher. So that's exactly what we do. Maybe go for a bigger salary. Maybe what you need is a relationship in your life. Or maybe we need some kids or a bigger home. And so we have all these different goals we're going after. You're thirsting after it. You're working towards it. And then you get to this one. You drink it up. And this is the one, right? You are satisfied just like you thought you would be. But what happens? Well, it's like a vicious cycle. You get hungry and thirsty all over again, and seemingly there just is no end. But there is an end, and that is the whole point to that quote, one of the loneliest moments a person will ever experience when they achieved that which they thought would deliver the ultimate. In the end, that one lets them down. See, the big question is this. What happens when you finally arrive at a place where you no longer, like all the previous times before, can say, I know what I'll do. I'll just go to the next rung of the ladder. Nope. Can't do that this time. Why? Because you're at the last rung of the ladder. 
You can't say, oh, I'll just, I'll go up a little bit more from here. Nope, there's no more elevation. You're at the peak of the mountain and yet still left hungry and thirsty for more, but far worse than all the other times because now there is no next. This is a reality that we see in the lives of professional athletes, rock stars, movie stars that have the fame, they have the fortune, man, they've got the life. And what do you see going on in their lives? It's a constant drama playing out, destroying their own lives with drugs, alcohol. They're miserable. They got the dream job. Who wouldn't trade to be in that guy's shoes? Get to go to parts unknown? Like, what a dream job. Taking his own life? And we're like, why? We're trying to make sense of it. We can't wrap our minds around it. Well, maybe having all that the world has to offer isn't really all that is cracked up to be. And we hate to believe that. We hate to think that way. But we get so focused around this whole pursuit of happiness. What is going to deliver that happiness? No fame and fortune. Nothing the world has to offer. In fact, the wisest man that ever walked the face of this planet, Jesus, he framed it this way. He says, what's a profit of man if he gains the whole world, but in the end loses his soul? And so for me, I guess you could say becoming a Navy SEAL, that was my gaining the whole world. But the reality was my soul was not oriented correctly. I didn't have a right relationship with the creator. But I didn't know that that was the answer at the time. I never went on a spiritual quest after that. I just kind of felt miserable. I thought, man, like that's it? You see behind the curtain and like that's all there is to it? And so I'm on a team and just like so many of you here, right, I put on a front. I'm a certain way in front of my family. I'm a certain way in front of my coworkers, in front of my friends. I wear the armor, right? They're like, Chad, you did. He became a seal. I, just, I play right into it. Oh, yeah, living a dream. Rock star. Truth, more miserable at that stage of my life than I've ever been. Again, just looking forward maybe to getting a little revenge overseas. That's a horrible fuel to live off of right there. And so as I'm on a team and getting ready to deploy, going through a workup, I really felt like I just didn't feel any more deep down inside. And so what was it that made me feel, what stimulated me was, to go out and drink. I really adopted the whole work hard, play hard mentality. Like that was something that stimulated me and made me feel. Uh, but of course, drinking into an oblivion, just blackout stage like that, it, it led to a lot of foolish stuff. Looking back, it's just, man, it's just personal robbery. It's shameful. And uh, everything really came to a head one night where I needed to get 26 stitches in my knuckles for a thing I completely have blacked out. I don't remember. My family's confronting me saying, look, we love you, but... If this is what you're going to do, you're not welcome at our home anymore. I didn't care about that. All I cared about was if I'm not welcome at the home anymore, I just need to get in there one last time because I got a keg of beer stash in the garage I want to get to. So I'm showing up after getting stitched up. I want to go out and drink again. Just got to get to that keg. And my dad's confronting me saying, what are you doing? So I know I kind of owe him one, right? Scared the family a little bit. So I know what they want. They want me to go to church. I haven't been to church in a long time. I figure, you know what? They got this midweek evening thing. I could punch my card in at church. I could suffer through this. And, uh, you know, it'll be over in a matter of time. And this evening thing will be over by 9 o'clock. And I'm not even going to start drinking until 10 or 11. And so I just say, oh, you guys want me to go to that thing? I'll, I'll go. You will? Yeah, let's go. I thought, man, I'll just go. I'll fall right off their radar as they go to sleep. And then I'll go grab that cake. And off I really go with my friends. It's a win-win situation. So we go. And that evening, there was a man by the name of Greg Laurie speaking there. <laughs> and he opened up 2 Kings chapter 5. And so 2 Kings chapter 5, let's get into this now. If you remember here, Naaman, here he is. He's this commander. He's had great success in battle. He's got an entourage of men that highly respect him, highly regard him. Even the king, it says, enjoys Naaman's company. So this status of this identity of his, it's getting him into places. He's rubbing shoulders with the king says he's a mighty man of valor. Could have been a seal had there been such a thing during his time. Mighty man of valor, but a leper. Well, Jesus, looking back in the New Testament, he says nobody during the time of Naaman had ever been healed of leprosy. And so now, circle back and picture Naaman's life like this. So much for all that success. So much for being uh, this commander that fearlessly leads his men into battle and whoever he rubs shoulders with. Because the truth is, underneath all that armor, what's really going on with Naaman? The truth is that underneath that armor and underneath that clothing, he's deteriorating. He's falling apart. The guy is a dead man walking. Well, how quickly I relate with that man right there as I found myself listening. And so again, consider, who are you? What kind of armor do you have on? In front of all the people around you, your little sphere of influence, when in reality, you feel like that dead man walking. So I'm listening. Well, there's nothing Naaman could do about this himself, right? It doesn't just wash off. 
But he hears about a prophet over in Israel. He just, this little servant girl, she's the unsung hero. She just speaks up and says, if my master would go see the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. So he decides, I'm going to go. I need to get the okay from the king. King gives him a letter. And he is bringing the equivalent of millions upon millions of dollars. What is he going to do with that money? He's prepared to buy his way out. Like, I will give you my wealth. Just give me my life back again. And so he makes that big trip, gets all the way there, and look at what happens. To give you a little bit of historical context during that time, the more important of a person you were, it was a custom. They would come out to greet you. Uh, for instance, if it was a king coming to town, man, people would come outside their doors and outside the city gates, there would be a welcoming party, right, to greet them. And he gets all the way to the door and still... This prophet doesn't even come to the door. He sends a servant to the door to relay this message that if you just go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times, your flesh will be restored to you. You will be clean. Look at Naaman's response. He says he became furious. I mean, could you imagine he just came all this way with his men and this guy doesn't even come out to give him a face-to-face -face conversation? He gets disrespected in front of his guys and then as far as he's concerned, basically he gets told just to go try and wash it off. I think he hasn't tried that yet. So if we're wondering what's going on inside of Naaman's head here, we don't have to wonder at all because he vents out loud in the scriptures. He says he becomes furious. He turns, he goes away in a rage, and he says exactly what he's expecting. I expected him to come out. He's expecting the red carpet treatment. He thought this guy was going to put on a big show. Oh, what an honor to have Naaman here. He said, I thought the guy was going to come out, wave his hand over the place, call him the name of the Lord, he's God. And just wipe the leprosy away. Instead, he just gets treated like a normal and gets told, go try and wash it off. He's like, aren't the waters where I'm from in Damascus far cleaner than all these waters over here in Israel? If I could just go wash it off, why don't I go to them and be clean? So if you haven't missed it yet, if you haven't caught it yet, I should say, what's the name of his real problem? What's his real obstacle here? Yes, his pride. It's his ego. It has got to go. Now, here's the cool thing. As he's leaving and he's about to completely miss it and blow it, check this out. This jumps out is that, you know, Naaman is surrounded by some men that really care about him. They're looking out for him. They're not going to let him off the hook quite that easy. And maybe you were brought here by a friend like that, or maybe you've been brought before by a friend like that. I'm sure these guys don't know how this all works out, right? But they know this much. We need to get our Naaman back in front of that God of Israel and something supernatural is going to take place. And so they're running up to him. They're pleading with him. They're saying, they're just trying to use straight logic. Naaman, you know if this guy gave you some big, great thing to do, you would have done it. I mean, think about it. Yeah, what if, what if the guy did come out, put on a big show, roll out the red carpet? Oh, we got something only a mighty man of valor can do. It's going to take strength and might. Kick off your shoes. We got broken glass. You're going to run it. We got a CrossFit exercise. If you finish the wad in the right amount of time, you will be healed of your leprosy. Naaman would be like, show me. Show me where to start. But because it was such a simple thing, what did it seem like to him? A foolish thing. And that's exactly what the Bible says about the preaching of the cross, that it's foolishness to those that are perishing. And here is Naaman perishing. But something these guys say, God uses. It gets through. And Naaman's about to do what I think is by far the most difficult thing for any one of us to do. He is about to humble himself. Like that moment where he decides, I'm going to do it. He's got to change direction. There's a lot more going on than a mere physical change of direction. There's like spiritual, emotional mental like change of direction going on right now I think he gets it that I gotta go to my own funeral in order for me to live I gotta die and so he's humbling himself he's doing what no soldier would ever want to do he's surrendering surrender to none but one to God and I think he gets it now it's not the water it said if I'm faithful I just do what this God of Israel wants me to do be faithful in that he will be faithful, and he will do the hard part. He's going to do the heavy lifting. Dips himself seven times, comes up. And the literal language in the Hebrew, it says he had brand new skin like that of a baby. Could you imagine that filth of leprosy just being spotted and blotted, things falling, and then brand new skin like that of a baby? It's a pure miracle. It's an act of God. I remember being on the edge of my seat and just listening like, whoa. This is like watching a movie. And I love going to the movies during that time, especially, because the movies, to me, was kind of like a little bit of an escape. 
You know, you get away from just all the clutter and debris of life, whatever's going on outside. And for a little bit, the lights go down and you get to live vicariously through a character and it's kind of enjoyable. But just like any movie, a movie like Batman, the hero, man, they go through some adversity, tough times in the beginning. Life is a storm, you know, but it's like what they do in that storm is what makes them a man. And then all of a sudden it all works out for the hero in the end. That's just how those movies go. And then what happens? Then the movie's over. Then the credits roll and the lights come back on and now you gotta go back outside into that bright reality of just the debris of life. It's over at that point. Well, I wanna make a point to all of you that the credits don't roll right there. That just as God provided a way out for Naaman, he's provided a way out for you and I as well, but we gotta understand we got to understand our condition first. Naaman had leprosy, right? This disease that was destroying him, it leads to death. What's going on underneath it all for us? We have a disease that's destroying us, and we could call it SIN positive. It's sin. Naaman's leprosy, it was leading to death. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And that's not just a mere physical separation from the body. It's appointed once for man to die. Then comes the judgment. It's what the Bible refers to as the second death, and that's separation from the creator. But it's not just off into the ether, nothing. It is a place where I can't sugarcoat it. Jesus taught about the topic of hell more than any other topic. Why? Because he didn't want anyone going there. It's not a scare tactic. It's just like if you really love somebody and they're smoking uh, you know, cigarettes or meth, you're going to let them know, like, hey, there's devastating consequences that come with that. I'm not trying to like, use a scare tactic because I love you. Jesus doesn't want anyone going there, but he lets us know it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth where the fire is never quenched, the worm does not die. It's a place of, of agony. That's scary. And there's nothing we could do to fix ourselves, to get the sin off of ourselves. It's on us, like leprosy. But God provide a way out. What is that way out? We, do we dip into some water? No. God dipped his son down into the world. Jesus came on a holy Rescue mission, hostage rescue mission. And he lived the holy, perfect, sinless life. This is the life that you and I have not and could not ever live if we're being honest. Now that leprosy in the Old Testament, it gets personal here. What is that a picture of? That is a picture, remember, of our sin. Aren't we, spiritually speaking, apart from God, just spotted and blotted and blemished? But Jesus, he was holy and pure, wasn't he? He was without blemish. And then he goes to the cross. Why did he go to the cross? The scriptures say explicitly why he went to the cross. You can't miss it. To save his people from their sin. So here's the picture. Jesus at the cross trades skin with you and I. He takes our leprosy, our sin, upon himself so that we could be switched and lavished with God's grace and his mercy. He dies in our place as though he lived our life and we get the life that he lived as though we lived that life. It's a big switch right there. Not only that, he rises again from the dead. That's important to point out too because it shows he has power not only over sin, he has power over death. That's a very big deal. The grave can't hold him down. And as he is risen, he declares to you and I, speaking of that resurrected life that overcomes the grave, he says, because I live, you also shall live. In other words, you can have that as well. How? Where does it start? Well, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, you must deny self. It's the first move Naaman needed to make. He needed to go to his own funeral. That self-denial is what the Bible calls repent, which is not just sorry I got caught. It's I'm so sorry I want to change. So sorry that I am just repulsed by this person that racked up and stored up the sin that Jesus died for on the cross. I turn from that sin. That's what it is to repent of it and place your faith and trust in Jesus. Faith and trust to do what? To do exactly what he says he will do. We call him the savior because he saves you. Saves you from what? Saves you from your sin. Repent and trust in him. The moment any man or woman does that, they don't have another man's word on it. It's God's word. He says, he'll remember your sin no more. Removed as far away as the east is from the west. Just as Naaman's leprosy was wiped away, blotted out, the New Testament says, repent and be converted. Be changed that your sins may be blotted out that times refreshing may come. For me, March 14, 2007 is the evening that I heard this message, and here's what I comprehended. I grasped that this is true. Like, this is truth right here. And I really kind of felt like this, too. Because I've been to church many times before, and I feel like God has extended the hand, extended the hand, extended the hand to me. I kind of felt like God's opening the door again for me to respond, and something just told me, like, 
this might be the last time. You know, there does come a certain point where you can harden your heart and harden your heart and harden your heart so many times against God to finally it really just be, becomes like that concrete. Something told me I need to respond right now. And so I responded the way we're supposed to in Scripture, repent and place my faith and trust in Jesus. And I, something I understood was that he's not only Savior. It's not only like you saved me from my sin, but I understood him as Savior and Lord. And as Lord, my thought was a lot like an assault leader on a SEAL team. My assault leader informs me on how I ought to shoot, move, and communicate. And as Lord, he's my assault leader in life. He tells me how I ought to look at things and think about things. And so that March 14, 2007, I responded to the gospel. And this is what the scriptures say took place. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Like old things pass away, behold, all things become new. I really felt the old me was crucified on the cross with Jesus, he's dead. And as Jesus was buried in that tomb, the old me was buried. As he rose again from the dead new, God offers me that new life, that new start. And it's not just thanks to you when I get to heaven, but it's while I am here on earth, now I have a lane to be in. I have God with me, as Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And suddenly now, the life that I live, now it's more purposeful. Now I actually do have this sense that I am complete in Christ. I'm not hungry and thirsty for more. I'm experiencing what Jesus says. If you know, anyone drinks of my living water, you'll never thirst again. How is that? The search is over. You have no need for another. I could die happy and content, but everything else is just gravy. I could be a seal for Christ. You could be a stay-at-home mom, stay mom for Christ. You could be a construction, a corporate guy for Christ. What you do has more meaning when you're in Christ because you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do on the name of the Lord Jesus. Suddenly now these like temporal little things that you, know, you would think just fade away with history, they don't. Because now when you take the Lord and you involve him in the things that you do, you're bringing the eternal one and you're bringing that type of significance into the temporal things that you do. So now they echo an eternity. And so that's how I, I pictured it. I'm sealed for Christ. Now fast forward to that final operation. I wish I had time to hit the details. Let me just cut to the chase. Obviously I made it out of that situation alive. But it doesn't always work out that way, does it? And so I want to really emphasize the fact that our freedom isn't free. Paid for in the currency of our soldiers' blood on the battlefield. And I want to highlight a few. One would be Michael Mansour, who's a U.S. Navy SEAL in a place called Ramadi, Iraq, providing cover, protection for other SEALs out in the road. When from this unknown location, an insurgent made his way to the house, he throws a grenade up on the roof, and the thing bounces off his chest, falls in the dark. And if you could imagine an exit just a step away, that grenade is not his problem. But there's other SEALs on the roof that didn't have time to get up into the exit. And so Mikey, in a split-second selfless act, his final word to these guys is grenade. So they had time to take cover as he covered it with his body. And it went off. And he absorbed the shrapnel, the shock of that grenade upon himself, and he died. But because of what he did, every single one of these other guys on the roof, they all lived. And so you can mark these words down in history. Greater love has no one than this, than one that lays on his life for his friends. My friend Scott, although he was killed and all these awful things, drug and hung from that bridge, looking back, it wasn't in vain. One of the last things he ever said to me was, Junior, perhaps I can make a difference. He was over there for the sake of freedom. And in his life, I see the truth of those words as well. Greater love is known than this one that lays down his life for his friends. Now finally, one more to consider. It would be the one who spoke those words of greater love. This is a quote, and who said it throughout history? It was Jesus, and he said it at a very unique time. When? Prior to going to the cross. So think about the cross this way. I have no doubt that you all here have the utmost respect, appreciation, patriotism towards guys like Mike Monsoor, Scott Helvinston, and so many others that have gone before us. You have the right feelings there, and you think about it the right way. Now, if you could take that perspective and use it almost like a lens to look through, and look at the cross through the lives of Michael Monsoor and Scott Helvinson, this is what the cross kind of begins to look like. Because we should never be talking nonchalantly about these guys that have gone before us, and we should never talk about the cross so casual either. It should impact us the way it impacts us when we hear about these guys. Jesus at the cross absorbed the blast. Not of a hand grenade. What did he absorb the blast of? He absorbed the wrath of our sin upon himself. He covered it. Why? So that we could be set free from the eternal consequences of it. That grenade was never Mikey's problem. He could have saved himself. And sin was never Jesus' problem. He could have saved himself. 
but he took it upon himself because we were the ones caught in the crosshairs of it. And as my friend Scott killed and, and hung from that bridge, remember, for freedom's sake, that's why he went there. Junior, perhaps I can make a difference. Never forget that Jesus, when he went to the cross, he was hung, wasn't he, from that cross? Why? So that we could be set free from the eternal consequences of our own sin. So greater love is known than this one that lays down his life for his friends. You can see it in men like Mike Monsoor and Scott Helvenston. And now look to the cross. That's the proper perspective of that King of Kings, that Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It says, for he speaking of the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, he was sinless, to become sin for us that we might become the righteous of God in him. Why is that word might there? Because realize this, it's not a default position. Not everybody will. In fact, Jesus himself warns the majority won't. He says, wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. He's talking about hell there, another teaching. Many go in by it, the majority. He says, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. Well, what's the difficult thing to do? Because if you want to enter through that narrow gate, the difficult thing to do, I'd say it's the naming thing to do. Humbling ourselves. The reality is, is that the majority of the world ultimately will shake their fist up at God and refuse to repent of their sin. They'd rather say, I'm doing it my way. And he will grant them their wish. If your love for sin outweighs your love for your creator, he'll grant you your wish. But if you come to a point maybe where you realize, I move because he first moved. We love him because he first loved us. You know what? I see what he's done for me. And now my love for appreciation and adoration for him outweighs my love for sin. And I want to disassociate with this. And place my faith and trust in him. For those that do, the reward is great. He says he'll remember your sin no more. You have a place with him in eternity. You will overcome the grave. And not just that, now your life here on earth that actually does begin to carry eternal weight and significance and purpose because you're not doing it on your own or for yourself. You're doing it with him. And so Jesus, he puts it this way. It's kind of like a pledge of allegiance, it's kind of like, where's your loyalty at? That's what this life here, is, here on, on earth is, is all about. God made us to have a relationship with us. What got in the way? Sin. Sin is separated us from our creator. But Jesus came to do something about that sin so that that obstacle can be removed out of the way. And so we need to respond. So we're here to know God, but unfortunately sin got involved. So he's decided we're going to kind of start anew. We're going to have a new heaven and a new earth if you want that relationship with him, though, you need to respond. And so this is the proving ground. This is where you say what ranks you are in. By default, if you didn't know this, the Bible says you are a child of wrath, a child of darkness, because we are born into sin. That's the default position. But you don't have to stay in that default position. If you want out and you want a relationship with your creator, Jesus says, if you confess me, I will confess you. Maybe you're saying, I'm just abstaining, I'm holding back, I'm not gonna cast a vote on this one. You can't stay out of this one because he'll say it for you. He says, you're either for me or you're against me. And so this is the proving ground. That's why I say that. This is your opportunity to confess him and pledge your allegiance to him. To say, I renounce sin and I declare him as my savior and my Lord. I wanna follow after him. So for those of you that would like to do that, God's speaking to you. Maybe he's opening a door for you right now that you realize is open and you need to be stepping through. This is a golden opportunity to do just that, to take Jesus up on his word and confess him. So if you would, just bow your heads together and pray with me. Let's open up that opportunity. Father, we come before you thankful for this day, for the times that we live in, for the freedoms that we have, for those that are defending this way of life right now, Thank you for them being living sacrifices, and we thank you for those that have sacrificed. We thank you for your son, Jesus, most importantly now, who shed his blood so that we could have freedom, not just here on earth, but eternal freedom. While everyone's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just ask if you find yourself here this morning, maybe realizing you have been playing the part of Naaman, you are this man or woman on the outside, you wear the armor. When in reality, underneath that facade, the truth is, that you are miserable when you are struck through with sin and you're realizing now that is what's destroying your life. That is why you have no peace because you don't have this peace with your creator. 
this obstacle is in the way, but you don't want that. You want to get right with him. Well, there's nothing you could do on your own. But Jesus already did all that heavy lifting. What you're called to do is the name and thing, though. It's time for you to repent and place your faith and trust in him. And so if that's you and you would like to, I would love to lead you in a prayer, this confession. You can make this profession of faith right now. If you would like to do that, I ask wherever you are, just lift a hand wherever you are. Just hold your hand up and we will pray together. If that's you, you know you need to get right with your maker. I see many of you with your hands up. I just ask if your hand is up, hold your hand up all the way. This is all in. So prepare yourselves like men and women, fearfully and wonderfully made by your creator. Maybe you come in here playing the part of a prodigal. You have lived a wasteful life. You would identify as a Christian. That's the label, but you know the content on the inside of that bottle does not match up, and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. If that is you, this is a time for you as well. We could pray together. And so if that is you, I just ask, would you hold a hand up as well right now? Praise God. Praise God. Keep your hands up all the way. And now I just ask this. If your hand is up and you mean this, Consider this now. If you mean it, stand up to your feet and we will pray together. And if you don't mean it, it's the perfect opportunity for you to slip your hand back down. Don't worry. No one's going to notice. And so if your hand's up and you mean it, stand up. And if you don't really mean it, slip your hand back down. Don't waste your breath. Don't waste your time. Don't waste God's time. It's all in or nothing. It doesn't work any other way. There's no deals that you can make. And so I just want to make that clear. Because unfortunately, there are times where people will pray and they think they did it, but they never really were giving God an empty template to work with. And they experience no change. And they need to understand that is the reason why. It's all in or nothing. So those of you that are standing up right now, just you, everyone else, head bowed, eyes closed, praying for them. I ask those of you standing right now that you would please just open your eyes and look at me. I want to make it very clear right now that as we are about to pray, there's quite possibly a scenario where this prayer is meaningless. And that's if you don't think about the words that you're saying and you don't mean the words that you're saying and you just rattle them off like it's a spell. It doesn't work like that. What makes it meaningful is the content of the prayer and taking ownership of the words. The content is you are repenting of your sin and you're placing your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. If you mean that, it will be meaningful and it will echo in eternity. And it's good news. So are you guys ready to do that right now? If you would then, from a sincere heart, out loud, after me, repeat these words. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross for me. I turn from my sin now, and I ask you to be my Savior and be my Lord. Thank you for loving me and dying for me and help me to follow you from this moment forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you guys. That's what we're celebrating over. Yes. And I want to encourage those of you that prayed. If you meant those words, and God knows if you did, most importantly, and remember, not a man's word on it, but God's word on it. He remembers that sin no more. He removed as far away as the east is from the west, and he's not done with you now, though. The whole purpose of life is to know God, but then what? To make him known. And so this is for the whole church, the family of God, those of you that, that know him, Consider this. Like, why are you still here? Why hasn't he snatched you up? I promise when he's done with you, he will. He will take you, all right? But he's not done with you. You are here for a purpose. The Bible calls us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, soldiers for Christ. And we are engaged in warfare. Christianity is not a playground. It is a battleground. C.S. Lewis says enemy-occupied territory. That is what this world is. But Christianity is a story how our rightful king has landed. That's Jesus. He says, you might say in disguise. And that hits it dead on because he came to his own and his own didn't even know him. So he comes in disguise and now he's calling us all, those that know him, to take part in his great campaign of sabotage. Do you want to take part in a campaign of sabotage? That resonates with me. Well, who, who, are, who are we sabotaging? The enemy, the enemy of our soul. Navy SEALs have been given a duty and a task to sabotage terrorists. If we're effective at what we do, we stop a suicide bomber from taking people out. Because think of the mode of operation of a suicide bomber. They strap up, they know they're going down, but they're not content with just that, are they? What do they want? They want to take out as many people with them as they possibly can in the process. 
Think about the evil one. He is strapped. We've read the back of the book. He knows he's going down. But he's not content with just that, is he? What does he want? He wants to take out as many people with him as he possibly can in the process. And you've got to make that personal. Who does he want? He wants your family. He wants your kids. He wants your coworkers. He wants your friends. But God has commissioned you as a soldier for Christ. The Great Commission, which literally means duty and a task. To do what? To make disciples. He's given you a weapon. A weapon that could really reach out and touch somebody. The greatest weapon that we have. The gospel. That's the weapon we have to charge the kingdom of darkness with. Why? Because the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. What does that do? If someone responds to it, it destroys the plans of the enemy. It foils his plans. He no longer can take that person to hell with them. His next best move, though, you got to know. Amen. We're a little over time, too. i got to wrap it up. But his next best move for the church, for those of you that know him, if he can't take you to hell, he's going to try and do everything he possibly can to cause you to be ineffective for the sake of God's kingdom. And so if you're not up there on the front lines, then he's exactly where he wants you in the back. And that's why maybe you don't ever you know, experience any kind of spiritual resistance or attack. So you got to get out there to the front lines. I love these words by C.T. Studd. I'll kind of wrap on this. He says, one life it will soon pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. And then he says, and when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the, if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. That should be our prayer. We, we don't want to burn out for ourselves. We want to burn out for him, right?